Is everybody excited? It is so good to see all of your beautiful faces. We've been putting this show together for you guys for many, many months uh, from uh, beautiful sunny Florida, <laughs> and uh, uh, it's nice to be here in person. I can't wait. So without any further ado, I'd like to in, uh, introduce someone very special to me, my co-panel host, Kevin Lyle. Please welcome Star Wars artist, Kevin Lyle. How you, How you doing, Kevin? It's good to see you, buddy. Ke Kevin is uh, one of the best panel hosts uh, that I know. So He's the uh, second best. Yeah, I'm the okay, second okay, best. Okay. No, 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 you're the best. Uh, so uh, it, it's a pleasure to have him here every year at ICCCon. So you guys are going to love him. Uh, without any further ado, what you guys came to see, the Emperor himself, Ian McDermott. Magic of technology. <laughs> Good morning from the dark side. <laughs> that, that's a fantastic way to start and a good question I, I have for you. Okay. Where did you come up with that voice? Um, sort of round about there, actually. <laughs> uh, it was, I don't know, I saw uh, a great Japanese actor in Edinburgh at uh, the International Festival there, and he was appearing in a production of Medea, which is, uh, some of you will know, a great Greek tragedy. He was actually playing a woman, and he was very young, but he produced an extraordinary voice. And like many Japanese actors, their training enables them to do it from the stomach, from below. Most of our resonance as actors is either in the head, which it is now, or in the chest, which is there, but further down, you can get it from the stomach. <laughs> uh, you, you can't do it all the time, otherwise you'll be throwing up, I beg your pardon. <laughs> but, you know, it's short takes, so, um, so it worked. Also, I thought it went with a face, really. You know, a disgusting reptilian face. So it is needed a disgusting reptilian voice. It, it is incredible, because there's even there's a, there's a famous uh, company that has a tagline, that's just this peaceful tagline that they say, and but you say it, it sounds so evil, and that's, um, do it. Oh, yes. You know? That was my imitation, by the way. That was a, that's very good. I'm very impressed. Uh, that was a good day, uh, the do it day. Um, <laughs> you remember my horrible, devious character had arranged for himself to be, you know, imprisoned, kidnapped, and uh, in order, really, to slaughter Christopher Lee. And I didn't want to do that. I really like Christopher. Um, but uh, it, it had to be done, and Anakin was sort of dithering, you know. I mean, so uh, we, it was kind of fun. We did so many takes, this the way you do. And then I did one with sort of, sort of impatient, but being asked to do yet another take, and impatient with Anakin not doing his job. So it came out as, do it. <laughs> and and George, George said, that's the one. Uh, <laughs> And that I didn't know it would enter Star Wars history, but you know, here you all are. <laughs> and uh, and how did you uh, how did you get into Star Wars in the beginning? Let's go all the way back to 1982, yeah, I guess. Yes, God, many many years ago, when I was older and younger at the same time. If you if, <laughs> if you know what I mean, um, I just I'm so thrilled with this chair. I can't stop swiveling. <laughs> this, uh, a little before I answer your question, there's a little aside about this. You when know, they told they told me they squeaked not to move, and I said, "What about Ian?" Oh, they're really? Like, they're, like, they're like, they're oh, like it like, doesn't matter. Ian can do. I what like wants. a good swivel, but uh, when we were doing, <laughs> yes, thank you. When we were doing uh, the first one, Return of the Jedi, of course, I was in the chair, and everything was automated, you know. But uh, the, the automation could never hit the mark somehow. So George said, would you mind doing it? I said, no, not at all. So underneath, I've now ruined it for millions of you all over the world, underneath my garment were my little feet going. <laughs> you know. So every time I sit on a swivel chair, it all comes back to me. But to back, get back to your question. One day, uh, I, was, uh, I was at home, and the phone rang. It was my agent. And he said the great words, George Lucas would like to see you. Oh, I said. And outside of my window, I could see a car, which they'd sent from um, L Street Studios, where they were filming a film called Blue Harvest, which will, many of you know, was the original artificial 
title. Oh, it's gone dark. Uh, it's gone very dark, sir. Yes, I know. Have I done that? Um, <laughs> Uh, so, I, you know, a film called Blue Harvest that apparently George Lucas was making at Elstree. Well, it didn't sound very probable to me, but, you know, you want to meet George Lucas? Of course I do. So I got in the car, and it was lunchtime on set of a film that later was called Return of the Jedi. I think it was called Revenge of the Jedi before it was called Return of the Jedi. And I met George and Richard Marquand, the director of the movie, and we had a very nice chat, 10 minutes. Unfortunately, I can't remember anything we talked about, but it was nothing to do with movies or my career or their careers or anything. So 10 minutes was up and uh, I was thanked. And on the way out, George turned to Richard and said, hey, great nose. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's, that's sort of flattering, isn't it? I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> anyway I thought, no, yeah, I thought you're very good. You can come back. I thought nothing more of it really, until I got home, and the phone was ringing again. It was my agent who said, it's great news, you've got the part. I went, oh, that's great. What's the part? <laughs> and he went, you know, minutes later, leafing through some papers or other. Apparently, he's called the Emperor of the Universe. <laughs> so I said, okay, we'll be doing it then. <laughs> <laughs> that's the story. And, um, a nice, interesting segue from that. So 16 years later... The 90s, Mr. Lucas calls you back, or how, how, how do you get contact that way? Yeah, um, his casting director, a uh, charming woman called Robin Gurland, phoned me up and uh, said, George is in town, he'd like to say hello. Okay, great. So I thought, you know, maybe we'll have a drink or lunch or something like that. So I went along to his hotel. There he was, and I always say this, and it's a terrible joke, but uh, wearing the same shirt he was wearing all those years ago. <laughs> it's a check shirt. I'm sure he has one or two. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, it was like a, a, an apparition, like a, a sort of uh, legendary ghost. Anyway, he said, uh, can we get you something? What would you like? And I said, I'll just take a water. Thank you. And he said, well, do you know anyone who wants to play an emperor? I said, well, I think you know the answer to that. He said, yeah, I thought I did. You can give the water back. And that was the end of the interview. <laughs> and then he told me a little bit, but not too much, about the uh, prequels and about two characters, uh, one called Senator Palpatine. I said, oh, great. Yeah, he starts off as a, and George said, a perfectly ordinary, not terribly interesting, not obviously uh, evil or warped in any way. I mean, he was a politician, you know, so that's a, a, ki <laughs> the, the kind of given, isn't it? But there's another character, he said, um, who's, who is all of those things, who's really terrible, and uh, he has a sort of insidious effect on everyone or everything he touches. And I thought, well, that sounds a really good part. I wish I was playing that one. Little did I know. And that's the phrase for get it, joining up to the Star Wars universe, little did I know. <laughs> and that's the way it's always remained. But then I found out fairly soon that uh, those two people were one, and it wasn't exactly hidden from the audience either. So it was uh, the progression of evil, uh, not just my character, of course, but principally the descent into darkness of the guy who later became Darth Vader. So we were telling his story, and in order to tell his story, we had to, they had to tell a bit of mine as well. So I got lucky for the second time. And then you got lucky for the third time. You're exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing, because as you know, at the end of Return of the Jedi, I was killed. I was dead. And uh, how did I know that? Because I asked George Lucas after I'd gone down. I said, does he come back in any form, you know? Maybe he's another person, you know, maybe, I don't know, another creature. He went, no, he's dead. I said, okay. <laughs> so imagine my surprise when I got a telephone call all those years later from J.J. Abrams, who said uh, they were thinking of reviving, that word really, you know, resonated, the character. Um, was I interested? Was I interested? Um, so I said, yes, and I said, but you know, George told me he was dead. He said, yes, I think George would probably revise that view now. Um, anyway, in our script, he's very much alive. He has survived with great difficulty. Uh, I said, how has he managed that? He said, well, we don't want to go into too much detail at this stage. And I think at that point, they were also thinking that 
I might have frozen myself, you know, a bit like Harrison early on. Well, he didn't have much choice. Um, that was in case he didn't come back because he had another movie to do, I think. But, you know, <laughs> as far as the saga is concerned, you know, he was uh, iced or something. Didn't that happen to Walt Disney? Oh, I, there was a room. <laughs> There was, there was a, don't quote me, there was, there was a rumor anyway. Um, anyway, that clearly wasn't going to happen. They said no, but of course he would have a plan B, the emperor. You know, he's not an idiot. Uh, obviously, he might you know, be severely damaged in one way or another. So he had the best medical team in the universe standing by, and uh, presumably the best drugs and so on. So it was possible for him to survive. And you'll see also how he continued to manage that in that sort of galactic wheelchair that, that I was in uh, and uh, very carefully controlled by those little people underneath who were injecting me with all sorts of impossible fluids. And uh, that, was, that was his survival and he got himself to a state when he'd more than survived, he was ready to execute. Not Order 66 this time, but uh, another even more megalomanic plan than he had in mind. Uh, than before. So, as you say, I got lucky for the third time. Are you going to get lucky for the fourth time? <laughs> or you could, no comment. <laughs> That's very interesting. Uh, well, I can't, no, I'm, no I'm, I'm dead as a dodo. Uh, that's, that's unquestionable. I'll never forgive Daisy Ridley for doing that to me. <laughs> you know, the ingratitude of the grandchildren. You know, it's just, <laughs> do you find that, you know, you do everything for them, and what do they do? They incinerate you. <laughs> um, but as you know, he's a you know the universe is still alive, and he's around during certain periods when certain series are being constructed or you know about to be constructed. So who I have nothing to tell you, but <laughs> but but who knows? I, uh, whatever whether my physical presence will be there or not, my presence will definitely be felt. Now, Ian, we were talking a little while ago, and you said you wanted to, you wanted to hear from the audience. So, I'd love to. So uh, Dave, the, the silly little guy that introduced us, he's going to run around with a microphone, and you're going to be able to ask uh, questions through him. Do we hey. turn on the lights for that? Do yeah, that would down? be good. What do, we, Thank you. what do we do? Lights up, maybe? The yeah, Emperor somebody says, leaned this. against a, a light switch. <laughs> if you might be leaning against a light switch, please kindly check. Um, oh, oh that's not a joke. You're serious. Oh, you didn't mean to put, plunge people into the dark? No. I were, uh, it looks I thought, amazing. They thought it was a cue my joke. It you know. looks amazing. Yeah, yeah it was, However, it, it was great moon setting. In there. So do we have somebody who wants to come up to uh, Mr. Longwater for a question? I got one right here. Hello. Uh, Hi. What if question? If you could choose any other Jedi uh. to be your apprentice besides Anakin, who do you choose? Oh, it's such a difficult question. Um... You mean in the real world or, the, no, in the world of Star Wars? I don't know. Um, <laughs> it's very, very hard. Someone, I mean, I, I won't be specific, you know, somebody young and corruptible. <laughs> that sort of gives a quite a wide choice, really, doesn't it? You know, because that's what he did in Jedi. You know, Vader was sort of running down, literally. So he needed his son. He needed you know, the same kind of energy and so on. Uh, but the sun was bright enough not to allow himself to be um, seduced to the dark side. So it would have to be some young and unsuspecting talent. Uh, and there are a lot of those in the movie industry, so I could just sort of move around, you know. <laughs> and I, I could have the odd audition, you know, things like that. And, uh, and if they behaved themselves, they wouldn't get the part. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Uh, just wondering if you have a favorite piece of dialogue as either Chancellor Palpatine or the Emperor. Yeah, there are there are a few, um, but for bad taste reasons, I prefer Execute Order sixty six. Um, because, sad to say, there are a lot of people in the world putting out that order as we speak, so it's alarmingly relevant. Uh, you know, particularly in Ukraine, one might think. Are you ready? How long does it take you to put on the show makeup? Uh, half of my life. <laughs> uh, it was uh, the first time, it was four hours, yeah. And I was in the hands of the best people. Nick Dudman was the guy who did my face every day in Return of the Jedi. He went on to great things, continues to do so. He did all the Harry Potter work. All of those, yeah. 
all of those great creatures, faces, and so on, when the next work. Uh, and he was, you know, he was uh, well, not exactly an apprentice in those days, but he was a young guy, but clearly with great talent. Um, and I said, well, what can I, you know, sitting there in a chair, wh what can I do to help? He said, you could fall asleep. So I managed that, and it was, f it was 4 a.m. in the morning. He just wanted my face to be still so that, so that he could work, work his magic. And then when we went to Australia for Revenge of the Sith, a different team, very good team, Dave Elsie, yeah. And uh, George wanted me to be able to be the horrific man in the morning and maybe, you know, the chancellor in the afternoon. So he wanted something much faster than four hours. So they devised a kind of um, balaclava that I put on over my head and my neck. Uh, it was fine, but uh, it wasn't as good as Nick's stuff because it couldn't be as detailed, you know. But uh, it was also all right because in that film, as you'll remember, he was sort of in transition and he was particularly hideous before it settled down. And, uh, and as a result of Sam Jackson, you know. I don't know, Daisy Ridley, Sam Jackson, you know, what have they got against me? Anyway, <laughs> Sam ruined my face by, uh, with the help of, of Hayden course, you know, doing his best. Um, so that's a long way of answering your question. Hello. Hello, sir. First of all, thank you for doing these. We just love it. You're fantastic. Good to be here. Um, just wondering of the Emperor's powers. You eventually you used the lightsaber in the earlier prequels and that yeah. sort of thing. What is your uh, favorite power and that sort of thing, and how did you enjoy the lightsaber training and that sort of thing? Well, I was very surprised when I read the script, you know, two hours before we did the shoot, um, <laughs> to discover that uh, I, I did have a lightsaber and I was going to wield it because I imagined all my power was coming out of my fingers. You know, I thought that's, you know, why? who needs a lightsaber when you've got electric lightning? But of course, you know, he was moving out from the very angry senator and chancellor into the monster himself. So yeah, there were fight sessions and I did a bit of training. Um, with Nick Gillard, who's a wonderful fight director, he was very understanding of someone who's not naturally a swordsman, unlike Hayden and Ewan, who were just brilliant at it. I mean, amazingly good. Uh, I did a bit of that, but most of the work was done by my stunt double, who was fantastic. And uh, unlike a lot of stunt doubles, actually looked like me. So that was a relief. He was going to do most of the work. But then I did have to do the close-ups, obviously, and, you know, uh, all of that to make it look entirely convincing. So I, I, I got a bit of action, and, and that was fun, and, and it was good to do. And uh, I'm afraid I did hit Sam Jackson a couple of times. He was, <laughs> he was very understanding, but I think that's why he wanted to destroy me. You know, in a film. Well, then you knocked him out of a window. I did do that, yes, with the help of Hayden. Yes, that was perhaps a, li a little cruel, but... Uh, he obviously hadn't signed up for any more movies at the time, and it's, uh, it, was, it was all right. He was immediately hospitalized and recovered very quickly. <laughs> Who's next? Dave, where are you at? Uh, hi, Ian. Thank you so much for talking with us today. Um, I have a question for you, just as an actor. Mm -hmm. um, over the course of the three eras of films that you were part of, do you have a favorite memory, whether it's a scene that you shot or a day on set that was very special or enjoyable or just sticks out to you over your course with the franchise? I do, I can go straight to it. Uh, the, the, the scene I enjoyed most, and it's the one in which I had most to say, it was I think probably the longest dialogue season in any of the movies, uh, and that's in Revenge of the Sith, uh, the scene in the opera house, uh, where I finally uh, managed to get him to confirm that he's gonna join the, the dark side. And uh, that was originally going to be shot in a, an even more elaborate office. The interesting thing about offices was, you know, a lot of people didn't get much of a set, you know, as the green screen. And so I always got an enormous set. It was an enormous office. I imagined they'd sort of fix it later. But no, George said, no, that's how power works. Every time you get more powerful, you get a bigger office. And I think <laughs> that's how we're going to show it. But then when we got to do that scene, the one I just referred to, he said, I don't, you know, we've had the office scenes. I think we need to shift the look location a little bit and as you you know you like the theater and you're a theater actor I thought well maybe they could be chatting in a theater 
uh, in a box, you know, in the, the imperial box. Well, not imperial yet, but, you know, quite important box. And I thought that was a brilliant idea because it meant I could talk to him like that, but also look out there, pretending really I was looking at the show while having the kind of thoughts that you probably, you know, imagined he was having. Apparently, we were off. We were watching a squid ballet. Which it was called um, Squid Lake, if I'm not yes, mistaken. Yes, exactly. Yes, <laughs> book early to avoid disappointment. And and the, we played that scene, and it was very well written. That scene, so it was great fun to do. Uh, and it happened on a day. Excuse me, I'm just going to clear my throat. <coughs> I, I needed to do that, but also I really needed to do that on the day. Because we'd done, I think it was the previous, the fight scene with Sam, and um, so I'd uh, I'd had a busy day, and I don't know if you know wind machines in movies, but they're not they're not little thing underneath. They're driven by men, and <laughs> there are about four of them powered towards us during that scene to make you know the, the cloaks flow and the hair stand on end. All of which is good, but there seemed to be quite a lot of dust in Fox Studios in Australia, and about half of it went down my throat. <laughs> so at uh, I, it was a Friday afternoon, end of the day. I said, George, are we really going to do it now? Uh, he said, Yes, we'll do it now. You know, and if you know if we can get it better, we'll do it. We don't. We need to get it better. We'll do it on Monday. So I thought, All right. And we didn't even have time to run through the dialogue. Hayden and I, he'd been busy doing stuff elsewhere. And I said, well, I'm a bit worried about the voice. It might not sound, you know, what we'd all like it to be. And he said, well, we'll try it anyway. And then we, when we did the first little rehearsal, and Ian, the voice is great. It sounds as if he's in transition. I thought, okay, from, um, no, you know, from, as it were, the chancellor to, to, to the monster. So I stopped worrying about it then. But I... And now you're all going to go back and switch and look at the scene. But there is, and they've, they've treated it a bit. But um, I, every time I've watched it, which isn't, you know, that often recently, I'm conscious of the fact that half of the studio dust still down my throat. So it was a kind of nerve-wracking day, but it was also a great day. And um, wonderful working with Hayden anyway. And his concentration is always absolute. And since it was Friday, we didn't have time to do the reverse. In other words, all the shots were on me. He was there. And on Monday, um, all the shots were on, on him. Um, and I also, the reason I, uh, that sticks in my mind as a memory, is people say, hey, you know, are there any redeeming features? Is there anything at all that's good about the emperor? And I said, well, yeah, he loves going to the theater. <laughs> <laughs> He promotes the arts. Yeah, yeah. Good for him. You know, you, you, you called the emperor the monster, but I remember one yeah. time in an article, right when about Rand of the Sith came out, you said you, you, you played it as if the Senator Palpatine was the costume and the real person is the, what you just called the monster. That's true. Um, the, the great George said one day when we were doing uh, Phantom Menace, um, he said, now the thing about uh, uh, Senator, Palpatine. I mean, we know what's underneath. Well, you know, eventually people do in the movies, but uh, our discussion, you know, his and mine, tells us what's underneath. But if you thought of your face, Ian's face, the senator's face, as a mask, and that uh, your eyes, Ian's eyes, the senator's eyes, were in fact unreal, were contact lenses, or, you know, sort of whatever um, they end up being as the emperor, that might give you a way in, and uh, it was completely fascinating to be told that. Uh, you wouldn't notice anything, and I didn't have to do anything. If I'd done things, it would have been, you know, artificial. Uh, but it's wonderful to think of your own face and your own eyes as a mask, and behind that, underneath it, is something else, something, in this case, as monstrous. Okay, thank you. Dave, where you at? This gentleman's arm is so tired he has to use another arm to hold it up. So let's oh, get him down. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, so you were talking about the opera scene, and that actually is a good segue to what I was going to ask. Mm -hmm. um, would you ever be interested in uh, ever going deeper into uh, your relationship with Darth Plagueis or your master? Well, of course, that would be interesting, wouldn't it? Um, the only thing is, if, if they went into it uh, deeper in the movies, it would 
have to be played by a younger actor, you know, and that's a good idea, I think. Um, maybe one day they'll they'll do that. Um, and it would be very interesting to know, you know, what he was like when he was really young, as opposed to because we we meet him when he's well when when he is was my age when I did the movie, which was sort of early fifties. Be interesting to go back a little further further and see his. Um, I suppose we have to admit murder of uh, of Darth Plagueis. Yeah, I think I think that would be interesting, but uh, it would be another actor. I know they're refacing people these days. We can do anything, <laughs> and making them making them look younger. So I suppose it's not beyond the bounds of possibility. But it would be more interesting for another actor to get the opportunity to start that story. Great question. Uh, how might you contrast your work on some of the animated series with what you did in live action? What was it like working with Dave Filoni and some of those voice talents? Yes, working with Dave Filoni is uh, is a treat. He's a sort of genius, Dave, you know, one of the great Star Wars geniuses, <coughs> as George would be the first to say, I think. Um, but doing um, voice recordings for animated series is a lot less complicated, of course, than doing the actual movies. And it usually involves me going into a studio in Soho um, and Dave getting up early in L.A. and, uh, and um, you know, listening to, to the script that I've already received. So it, it's relatively straightforward. Uh, but, uh, you know, I have to do the voice. I send the voice to L.A. and, you know, they put it in the movies. So my question is on uh, the sci-fi technology. How is it, wh how was what was your experience like uh, through the first movies to the other to the last movies with uh, technology? CGI, technology. et cetera. CGI, yeah. yeah, it was very you know crude in the beginning and then changed. So yes, well it was very interesting that first day on Return of the uh, Jedi was uh, the first scene you see of me was in fact the first day of shooting. And when I came down that ramp, not able to see too much because the lenses in those days only enabled me to look directly ahead and not see out the corner of the of my eye. And on the first rehearsal, I mean, you know, I, I didn't really know where I was. I mean, you, I knew the set description, but I hadn't seen it when we rehearsed the first scene. So, um, you know, I did uh, what, what I'd rehearsed in my head and I uh, pretty said, fine cut, and then, when at cut, when I could relax for a moment, I looked around and I saw what looked like thousands of people, thousands of stormtroopers. Um, so unless you thought they were painted on, they were later, but they certainly weren't then. And they were policed by uh, crew people going up and down in jeeps, saying, "Stand up straight, you know, take your take your glasses off and things like that. <laughs> Give me that camera." And. Uh, <laughs> So uh, later on, I suppose, you know, that would, that would have happened CGI-wise in post because so many people, you know, so much money, et cetera, et cetera. Although CGI, as I found out later, is not cheap. It's very expensive to do the process. Maybe it's got cheaper now, you know, like things tend to over time. Um, and then, of course, I think Phantom Menace was about the first film filmed, if you can say these two words close together, uh, digitally. So uh, that was a new experience, and the whole green scene, blue screen sometimes, um, notion came into play. So when we were up, for example, on the pods, Natalie and I, Natalie Portman, uh, when I was being the senator and she was the queen, we were up very high, and everything else was green, and there were some stickers, some markers, showing us where the characters were, should we need to look at them. Um, as I was saying, I was asked about this the other day, and I was saying it wasn't too difficult um, because we do look at crosses every now and again when we're making ordinary movies. Um, if, you're, if you're doing a close-up and the, the actor can't really get to you because of all the people in front, um, it's better not to have their eye line um, because otherwise you'd be sort of doing that, which isn't helpful in a close-up. And what they often do is just put a white piece of tape, a white cross in the edge of the camera box and you pay into that. So, you know, as, as a film actor, um, we're quite used to that. But then I didn't have to do it on the same kind of, the same kind of scale 
as Hagen did and Ewan did. And they were often fighting enemies that weren't there. And George wasn't always able to tell them, you know, whether they were enemies that everybody would be scared of, even those guys, or whether it was just something they could shrug off. So they would offer lots of alternatives, which we try to do anyway as actors. But sometimes um, in the film, probably the audience wouldn't notice, it wouldn't make much difference to them, but the actors would see themselves reacting in a way they wouldn't have reacted if the thing had been real or if they'd known actually what they were playing to. So, I mean, we all surrender our, our performances. It's the right thing to do. What else can you do to that box that's taken away and edited and later becomes a movie? But occasionally, some of the actors felt they were th their performance had been surrendered but not, not used in a way that they would have done or chosen to have done should they have known what was coming at them. Um, so uh, it's, it's always better to have a human being to react to, in my experience, if you can. Uh, but sometimes it's impossible, and you know, as the techniques change, so we uh, adapt to those. But interestingly enough, on episode nine, the last movie, that was shot on film, almost all of it. And um, so we went back to the old way, and it was always people you know, that we had in front of us and people we reacted to. And we didn't have giant green screens um, every five minutes. We had, you know, a, a studio and a beautiful set, certainly in my scenes, for most of the time. Uh, uh, Dave, that kid's had his hand up for like half an hour, his face is turning red. <laughs> what was it like filming the scenes with Yoda? <laughs> yes, well, of course, Yoda and Frank weren't there. <laughs> to back to the digital experience. Yes, there was... Um, when I had to address him, so I was looking at him in the right, in a chair like this, I think, there was a, a sort of Yoda dummy, you know, not very helpful. <laughs> you know, we didn't have to spend time making that because no one's going to see it, uh, that I would address myself to. Uh, and then on the fight, of course, he wasn't anywhere to be seen. So I had to do a lot of jumping around and hissing and laughing and all sorts of things. That was a hysterical day. <laughs> and I just... George said, we got, we got about half an hour, just give us what you've got. So, <laughs> so I did. I mean, <laughs> and tried to keep a straight face, where a straight face was appropriate. Um, so that was, that was my relationship with Yoda. But my relationship with Frank Oz is, is very good. He's a great guy. And of course, I worked with him before when he directed Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. And uh, that was enormous fun. And Frank is enormous fun, apart from being a kind of genius. Right down this Right way. here in the front. Hi. Um, Hello. So I understand that you like to do Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, what's your favorite play of his and why? Well, um, that's an easy one. The, my favorite play of his is King Lear, which one day I'd like to play. Uh, no immediate plans. But if anybody's listening, you know, <laughs> you've, got my, you've got my agent's number. Um, and it's, it's one of the most well, perhaps the most pitiless of his plays. Um, it's about many things, but the central story of King Lear, in case you don't know, uh, is about a man with far too much power who abuses it, behaves in an authoritarian manner, has no interest in his people, is only interested in his immediate circle, and is not very interested in them. And then um, he makes the mistake, which seemed like a good idea at the time, of dividing his kingdom between, um, originally he's got plans, he's got three daughters, he's going to give them about a third each. Although the youngest daughter would get the largest part, but the youngest daughter refuses, uh, refuses to praise him. So he flies into a rage and banishes her to France. Um, and then he says he'll come and stay with the other two daughters, even though he's already divided the kingdom, and they don't want him. So he's rejected. And he becomes dejected um, physically and emotionally. Um, let me not be mad, he says. Well, he goes mad. And he's thrown out. He is nowhere to live. Uh, and the rain rains and the hail hails and the wind blows in his face. But he also sees what it's like to leave that kind of existence. In other words, to be homeless. No shelter, no food, no nothing. And he sees how a lot of his kingdom, a lot of the people in his kingdom, have lived their lives 
And the great irony of the play is he sort of regrets that he hasn't paid any attention to that while he was king, but now it's too late because he's gone mad. And then the play, you know, there are many other characters and many other situations sweeps forward. Uh, and at the end, it's extremely uh, sad and harrowing. And there's a little moment where he ach ach achieves sanity, but it, but it doesn't last. And it's, um, it's a cruel, difficult world. And uh, the play doesn't really offer any hope of it getting better. And yet it's a play that people love because I think it tells it like it, well, not always is, but is a large part of the time. And if you're living a kind of life in circumstances that are far from ideal, uh, it really resonates now. Do you own your an Emperor Palpatine action figure collection? No, I don't. Uh, <laughs> I... I, I Try not to, but I've seen some interesting ones, and friends of mine, you know, have very big collections. Uh, they're always asking me to sign. I said, "Well, you have to come to a convention, you know," and so I <laughs> joined the queue like everybody else. Um, but no, I don't. This is my the short answer to your question. You don't have you don't have one one little no I one I little start city. Is you know, isn't that no? a terrible thing? No, I don't think I do. No, I'm always interested, though, in you know, new ones that are brought along or photographs that come up. But no, I, yeah, I, I, I try. Otherwise, I think, you know, speaking of King Lear, I might go mad. <laughs> <laughs> One more youngling right here. Are you ready? Yeah. What's your favorite movie in, in Jedi? My favorite, my favorite uh, Star Wars movie? Uh, I think it has to be uh, The Revenge of the Sith because that's the one in which most happens to him and I've got most to do. Although I really enjoyed the last one, you know, having been resurrected. And I loved being in that mechanism, you know, that got me around, the, the uh, galactic electric, electric chair. <laughs> and it was, uh, I was fitted for it. Imagine being fitted for that. <laughs> and they, uh, they were going to have two. It was going to be one where I would be on my knees for the close-ups. Uh, but I thought that was going to do terrible things to my back, so we scrapped that. And I was standing upright and held in by, you know, every possible kind of safety device and manipulated by four guys uh, who were great. And they, they said, Ian, we're, 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 no, they were London, they didn't have an American accent. They said, Ian, you know, uh, w when you move, we'll, we'll give you a heads up. Okay. I said, yeah, that I'd be grateful. Thank you. And they would, would always give me a heads up, but it was usually the second after they'd taken off. So they were going to go now. Yeah, go. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I like flying around the studio. I do, I've always wanted to fly, and it was great fun. And uh, Daisy was worried more about me than I was worried about myself, you know. And she, she said, oh, God, I think I'm going to have a heart attack if they do that to you again. I said, no, 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 I'll be the one having the heart attack, okay? Well, <laughs> haven't you read the script? Anyway. That was that was that. Was that Stagehand Michael Caine? He sounded <laughs> like Michael Caine. <laughs> Maybe it was. Yes. It's always hard to see. You know, it's always so dark in those studios. Yeah. We're right we over here Dave. in the back. Way in the back. We're right here. My master wishes to know if you lost the fight to Mace Windu on purpose. Did you throw the fight? Uh, yeah, it was all worked out in advance. I wanted to get uh, no the character. Yeah. Oh, you, you, yes, the character really. It was he manipulated the whole of that. Uh, and it was principally about not just getting rid of Mace, but getting Anakin to do it, Anakin to get actively involved in uh, the path towards destroying people who got in my way. So, it's, yeah, it was a psychological ploy with huge practical effects. So you're saying officially uh, Alpatin would have beaten Mace? I don't, yeah, I don't like the word officially. Okay, uh, unofficially then. <laughs> yeah. Your Unof opinion. Unofficially. In this quite private conversation we're having this afternoon. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a great question. Yeah. Uh, Dave? Where is he at now? It's, like a, it's like a little right game. Right like find find yeah. the long water. Yeah. Where is it? There he is. Did you prefer being the... Where are you? Okay. Oh, yes, I see. Hi. Did you prefer being the council... The senator or Darth Sidious? Yeah, I think you know the answer to that, really. 
we actors love playing bad people. Um, although it was very interesting playing the senator, you know, for the reasons I uh, discussed earlier about the, my face being, you know, his face and, and so on. Um, it was very hard not to sort of do little bits of evil glinting, you know, but George quite rightly said, no, we just, you know, he's, he's too clever for that. You know, he's got this perfect mask and that no one would ever know what was going on underneath. Um, so I suppose that was, they were, they were equally enjoyable because they demanded different things. But yeah, if you're going to pin me down, Darth Sidious every time. Right over here in the center. Right. In the center. What would be your most memorable blooper that happened while filming? Blooper. Well, I can't possibly repeat it. I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe one day you'll see it. I was, I was up that flying thing, and uh, it was all very quiet and very careful. And I said the wrong words, and then I said an English phrase that uh, certainly wasn't in the script, <laughs> and and everyone screamed blooper. So I haven't seen it yet. Maybe it's around somewhere, but uh, that was that was it. Um, and also, you know, fly, uh, sliding down chutes and things like that. That's just made for bloopers, you know. <laughs> oh, yes, totally. Right. And and as I said earlier, up up there in my my flying machine, there were lots of moments. Um, across any of the nine movies, is there one scene or even just an actor that you're jealous that you didn't get to play or you would have loved to have? been in instead of your character? Uh, uh, it's quite an interesting question because um, it's, it's around somewhere and maybe some days, uh, someday they'll release it. But um, in the script that we filmed uh, about three years ago now, is it? Yeah. Um, I revealed the fact to, uh, to, to Adam, to Kylo, that uh, Daisy Ray was my granddaughter. Um, and uh, and in the movie, for it reasons of speed, really, um, it was you know Kylo already knew and told her that he did, I think. Um, but it was uh, when I read it, I thought this is a, you know I went what to myself. This is a great moment of revelation. And as the character, I liked having it, you know. And as the actor, I liked having it too. Um, uh, but the great frisson was in the studio when we did it because. You know, I'm I'm the only person who has, apart from you know JJ and a few other need to know people, uh, p p person who has the script. I mean, people in the studio, there's at least 200 people, probably more. You know, surrounding you, uh, they don't get a script. You know, they get they get to see what's happening on the day, uh, but not in advance. So they didn't know I wasn't dead, and. Uh, when my voice first came through, and there was a lot of this, and it was cut back again for the movie, when Kylo comes through to find me in Exegol, um, he wanders along for a bit, and my voice is the first thing that he hears, sort of tantalizing him. And, uh, and my voice was just like this. They gave me uh, a mic, and they said, it's a god mic. In other words, you know, the whole of the studio would, would hear my line. And they didn't know um, that I was going to be there. So on the first take, there was a lot of suppressed, oh my gods. You could just say, oh my, oh my god, you know. <laughs> and that was, that, that was great. And so when it came to the moment of, of revelation that uh, she was indeed my granddaughter, um, the oh my gods were sort of unrestrained, really. Um, and I, I think, uh, I just know, uh, Adam must have known. Yes, I think he did. He, was, he had his script, so it, it, it was clear then. Um, but it was, it, was, it was good to do, good to reveal, but, uh, you know, that's show business. And it exists someday, so you'll, you'll maybe see it as an extra on. We don't do DVDs anymore, but an extra somewhere. Yeah. Well, we're, uh, we're coming down uh, to the end. And, um, so I just want to ask you one last quick question before we go. We talked about our favorite Star Wars movies, Revenge of the Sith and Empire mm -hmm. always comes up. Do you have a favorite movie? Yes, I think it has to be Revenge of the Sith for the reason I said. No, I meant, no, I meant... Oh, you I mean meant of, of all of time? Of all movies. I wanted to know what your favorite yes, movie was. Uh, oddly enough, because it had a big effect on me when I was quite young. Uh, I was at drama school. Uh, Bonnie and Clyde. Um, for the reason was it was such a clever film and so brilliantly done, Arthur Penn. Wonderfully acted, uh, Warren Beatty and, and Faye Dunaway. And I, I, I think what caught my imagination was it was a film about two people who were immensely unsympathetic because, you know, they were bank robbers and killers and all the rest of it, but were also very sympathetic. 
And I like that contrast. I like being sort of, you know, encouraged, maybe even seduced, to empathize with people who are not really empathizable with, if that's such a word. Because uh, I, think, I think that's the essence of drama, really. It's a kind of confusion, but it's an enjoyable confusion because it makes you think and it makes you feel in different ways. And that film did that to me. Okay. Well, I want to thank you very much for coming. This was a fantastic interview. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I all I love that. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you um, all. The, e the Emperor will be here for the remaining of the weekend. Yeah. See you up. Ladies and gentlemen, Kevin Lyle and Mr. Ian McDermott. See you around. See you around. Thank you.